In this video, you'll be learning about this topic. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack with Lumen. So I need to start with just a general overview about the company and kind of the structure that's just become a little bit recently in place. We were, as a firm, we own Level 3 Communications, which was also a roll-up of different assets. If anybody was around in the early 2000s or in late 90s and remember people laying a bunch of subsea fiber from you know, New York to Spain and, and, and across the Atlantic and across the Pacific, Level 3 and uh, Global Crossing were exciting companies back then because of the idea that there's going to be this huge internet and we're going to need all this connectivity. We're going to need all this fiber that's connecting continents. Well, there was an overbuild. Global costing went bankrupt. I mean, there was just a, a lot of mess. But lo and behold, years and years later, guess what? The internet's bigger than anyone ever thought. And so Level 3 was the a roll-up that included Level 3's assets, a company, Global Crossing, a company called Time Warner Telecom. It's a mix of what we would call kind of like domestic US fiber, like underground, and then this, a bunch of subsea fiber that connects endpoints all around the world. And so we love this company. It's run by a guy named Jeff Story. We were level three shareholders when the merger with CenturyLink was announced. And we looked at it and we said to ourselves, Jeff Story looks like he's retiring. He's the guy that we like. We focus a lot on management at Cove Street. And we looked at the management team at CenturyLink and we said, this is not a group of people who we feel confident in and don't necessarily think they understand what they're buying. I think that has proven to be the case as we'll get into. So, but what is it now? So you have level three with a legacy CenturyLink business. And CenturyLink is what we just basically a rural telecom. So if you think about the company's based in Louisiana, think about rural Louisiana, they're the telco there. And so if you need phone, if you need a really slow internet connection, which is probably DSL, there's no fiber in these areas. And if you need a TV, that's where you're buying it from. And without any question, that's a shrinking business. So you have a global growing, asset heavy, almost irreplaceable asset business in level three, and you have a slowly shrinking, melting ice cube in CenturyLink. Jam them together. And what could go wrong? Well, a lot can go wrong. And so we are now a number of years into this merger. It closed in, I think, October of 2017. And a fair amount has happened. The old management team, unsurprisingly, is gone. It was 25 million plus. So he didn't need the money. They kind of begged him to come in as COO of the new company. And then quickly, it became clear that the CenturyLink guys had no idea what they were doing. And Jeff Story is now the CEO. So getting to management, we like management. And so that's a big part of our, our investment premise and research. So you have management in place. What is it now? It's about a $10.6 billion market cap company. It has a 10.3% dividend yield, which for your listeners might be kind of interesting. Where else in the world are you getting a 10.3% yield? It has about $35 billion in debt, which is a lot. And we'll talk about that and why we don't think that's a problem. And the business is essentially one third level three and two thirds century link. And so, our just to frame why this is interesting is that our general thought is that Wall Street doesn't do a good job with two things one, a good business and a bad business together. And the other thing is a business that is shrinking. The top line has been shrinking. And that's because you have the melting ice cube in century link that is kind of overtaking the potential growth that you said that we somewhat slightly less than we would expect for going forward growth that you're going to see at level three. And so Wall Street doesn't know what to do with that. That's why we see such a large undervaluation. Eugene will get into a lot about that going forward. So I think in terms of where of framing this investment, it is one of the most dislocated things we've ever seen in our careers. We scratch our heads every day being like, we just don't understand what the market's thinking. The dividend yield, I think, would imply that people don't think it's sustainable, the current dividend. And we'll get into that and why we think the dividend is sustainable. And then we'll get into what we think it's worth, which I think is why this should be really interesting for people. So let me get this straight. Level three has a lot of promise and a great management team with Jeff Story. And then they merge with CenturyLink, which is now two thirds of the new business. But it's sort of this melting ice cube, as you've put it, because it's sort of a dying industry. So what was the impetus for the merger and why is CenturyLink such a big portion of the new business? Great question about why the deal even happened. The short of it is level three was offered a lot of money to consummate the, the marriage. We were level three shareholders and we're happy to take the premium that was offered to us. And 
we sold out, as Ben mentioned, as soon as we realized that the surviving entity would be controlled by Glenn Post, who was the CEO of CenturyLink. The reason why the combined company is predominantly CenturyLink is because it was, at the time, a $17 billion revenue company. This was not a, a tiny entity by any means, and it was larger only in the in profit sense than level three. However, the actual valuation was skewed towards level. It's a bizarre artifact. This is basically like a, a company that was trading at, let's say, five times, buying a company that was trading at 12 times. And typically, the people who get, pardon my French, screwed are the shareholders of the company that's trading at five times. So we, as shareholders of level three, didn't care because we were getting a fantastic value for our investment. And the CenturyLink shareholders, well, they just, they took it in the pants. This actually reminds me of almost like Berkshire Hathaway, right? A dying textile business. Buffett overtakes this textile business that's ultimately failing and chooses to take some capital and buy stuff like insurance companies that's going to throw off some cash and kind of fuel the future of Berkshire Hathaway and made it into this conglomerate. Is it kind of the right way to think about this where CenturyLink sort of has a dying industry and they see the writing on the wall? So they make this investment in something like Level 3 that has more staying power and perhaps more scalability over time? That's exactly what the pitch was to the CenturyLink board when they discussed the acquisition. Currently, it's also still a truism to say that while it is a melting ice cube, the ice cube is melting at, let's say, 3 to 5% a year on a cash flow basis. And the good side, the level three side is growing. And yes, if Glenn Post was Warren Buffett, I would say that would be 100% accurate in terms of the uh, comparison. But unfortunately for CenturyLink shareholders, Glenn Post was the farthest thing from Buffett, which is just a, a little bit of a nuance. You know, Ben kind of alluded to it, but the combined entity, when investors woke up and realized that Jeff Story was not going to be the CEO, there was a rebellion within the shareholders because part of the deal also gave stock of the new entity to level three shareholders. And those folks said, there's no way that we're going to allow you, the CenturyLink management team, to manage this going forward. So you better bring story back in or we're going to vote you out anyway. So there is a, to say that the deal was loved, it would be the farthest thing from the truth. From day one, it was very contentious and it's taken Jeff Story three years to basically reconfigure the entity to be effectively level three again from a management perspective, obviously not from a revenue mix perspective, but certainly from the people who make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. And that ties into my next question. When did the merger close? The merger closed in 2017, and, and it's interesting, if you look at the stock price between the deal announcement day and the deal closing day, it was just down. I think the stock went from like, I think it was like $28, $29 to $18, $19. So I mean, the, clearly there were concerns about whether this deal, deal made any sense. So let's talk about the new entity. How does it make money and who are the customers? I will answer the question in a consolidated fashion, even though there are really two different parts of the business. The core of it is called IP services. And IP services is a fancy way of saying connectivity. So I'm sitting in this office speaking to you right now via you know, a video link through the internet. How do we get to that point, right? We have a building that's wired with fiber. We have a fiber running somewhere. Well, you're in LA, so it doesn't have to go that far. But again, if you were you know, across the country, it would go through a fiber line that runs from LA to New York and get into someone's building. So level three at its core was exactly that. They own metro loops of fiber within large, most of the large cities, in, not only in the United States, but in the world. And they had what's called on net buildings, which is a fancy way of saying their own fiber assets and copper sometimes wiring was inside the commercial building that we're in. And when we go ahead and choose the internet provider that we want, we could choose level three as the effective internet provider. So that's the IP services side. Then they have what I would call, they refer to it as wholesale. But if you think about it, obviously, there are many companies out there who sell internet connectivity to the point customer without actually having owning the underlying fiber networks. So there are a lot of brokers out there, even folks like Verizon or sometimes even Comcast. While they have the endpoints wired up, they don't have a way for you to actually, because of the, the way the internet works, right? 
just because you can plug in your cable modem doesn't mean that you connect to Sao Paulo, right? If you have a multinational, how do you get that transit data from LA to Sao Paulo? Well, you have to run through someone else's fiber network. And so that, that business is called wholesale, where you open up your uh, strands of fiber to other people's traffic. So that's another way that they make business money. Then you have what I would consider to be higher end services on top of the fiber. So these are things like security, fancy terms called SD-WAN and MPLS. And I'm happy to talk about what those are if you really want to know. And then things like content delivery networks, which are actually how we as consumers consume things like uh, Netflix videos and even get our updates from Microsoft or play games and things like that. So there are effectively ways for companies to minimize the use of their end servers by caching uh, or keeping copies local store more locally of commonly accessed uh, media. Netflix has now their own CDN networks. The largest competitor there would be Akamai, fantastic company that's publicly traded. So yeah, that's another one of their services. Then when you go down the stack a little bit further, you get into uh, what we would consider consumer. So consumer and Ben already kind of touched on it. They have um, a couple different legs there. They also have, um, this is kind of a bizarre aspect of being in rural America, but there's actually regulatory revenue that they receive from the federal government to the tune of five to six hundred million dollars a year. That's basically a subsidy to allow for people like in the sticks in Louisiana or Kansas, Arkansas, wherever, wherever there are, there isn't fiber or the ability to get high speed internet to get internet at all. And what people don't realize is this country is so vast that you need connectivity and the, you're not going to incentivize a private company to lay connectivity down on its own to a, a town of 50 people, right? So how do you get those 50 people connected to the internet? You provide subsidies. So the, the way that CenturyLink made money for many, many years and still does to some extent is to get basically free taxpayer dollars. So that's roughly $500 million right now. The other thing is obviously, and I just mentioned it, is broadband connectivity. They have fairly extensive, I'm saying, um, it was like $1.6-ish billion business connecting households to the internet. So it's not 100% fair to say that it's all DSL copper. They did, over the course of many, many years, spend money to transition a lot of their install base to be basically a derivative of coaxial cable, so competing with things that people like Charter and Comcast. So they do have actually, believe it or not, a pretty stable broadband customer base. And when I say stable, it's plus or minus 2% growth. Some years they might be slightly down, other years like last year, I think they were up by like 1.7%, something like that. That's another consumer leg. Then you have the real problem, and this is a problem that affects almost all legacy telcos. They have a voice business that I think was 1.9 billion, I want to say. So that voice business is, as you can imagine, going to be effectively zero over time because many of us don't have home phones anymore. And the only, only reason why people get them for some bizarre reason is because the cable companies like to bundle them together. But in essence, I mean, I think I had a home phone number. I didn't even know what it was for many years and I don't anymore, but that's happening across the country. And obviously the decline rate there is pretty intense. We're talking 15 to 20% year over year. That business, the reason why that matters is you would think that, well, that seems like a silly business to be in, but remember it's a hundred percent profit, right? So you've had phone lines laid over a course of 50 to 80 years, you don't have to really invest in them. It's just people pay you every single month for uh, this phone service that most people now with cell phones don't really need. So that is the other part of the consumer that's obviously been what's dragged down CenturyLink in total. And then you have another, call it the small and medium-sized businesses, which the services there run the gamut from connectivity of broadband to voice, and that they're also having obvious issues just in terms of being able to sustain their top line while every single year getting price downs on the connectivity side as well as the telcos, telephone service. That's kind of like it's a very broad range of ways that they make money, some of them growing and good, other ones obviously shrinking and bad. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 